Although in a child with epiphora we have to start looking right from the eyelashes because children can have caninitis in topia, epiblephron, dystichiasis as causes of pseudo epiphora. And also start looking at the pancta for punctal abnormalities. Punctal abnormalities could be failure of canalization of the pancta where you would just find a punctal dimple which you can perforate it with or without intubation to get relief. Pancta could be partially atritic or even completely atritic calling for punctoplasty. And of course the canaliculus. Canalicular problems in children are also well known. The canaliculus may not be developed at all in which case you don't have any solution except to do a conjunctival dactyl-cystorhinostomy. Or if the canaliculus is partially developed or partially atritic, you can bypass it wearing trip fines and then put a tube. But beyond that, it is all canaliculus dactyl-cystitis, which is a very common problem. The incidence is as high as 30% in term babies. But then about 2 to 6 percent remain symptomatic. Rest of them resolve spontaneously with or without parents having noticed a little bit of a before. The cause is specifically failure of canalization of the nasolacrimal duct. And that's of course embryologic. Whereas you are supposed to differentiate valvular block from bony obstruction. It is this valvular block component which 70% is not an absolute number, it may range from say 70 to even 90% in your spectrum of cases that you get depending on your referral pattern. But what I would say is that although a majority of patients have valvular obstruction, there is a subset of patients which will have non valvular or bony obstruction and the bony obstruction can be complete or partial. And those are the very same patients who do not resolve with any form of conservative therapy or even with probing and need DCR. It is not as high as 30% that would need DCR, only about 4 to 5%. Because even within this 30%, there are two categories relative bony obstruction and absolute bony obstruction. Relative bony obstruction is amenable to probing done in a particular way, whereas absolute bony obstruction is the one which would ultimately need that process or rhinostomy. Most of, most of the children will start developing symptoms at about 3 weeks of age. They start with having watering and discharge, matting of the eyelashes and some children even have chronic conjunctivitis. <coughs> Initially when the child comes in with pediatric epiphora, the features that I have mentioned which are pseudo epiphora and also the punctal and the canalicular problems have to be ruled out by a good office examination with magnification. You can use a 20 darker lens, held very close to the child's eye with a diffuse light that will give you a good magnification. Or you can even put a 10 darker lens in the direct ophthalmoscope when go very close to the child. Any source of magnification or a loop for example, whatever you can think of, keeping the child steady is what you need. Good illumination and magnification with a steady child. Even if the child is sleeping, that's okay. That's a good time to examine. Presence of pressure regurgitation. Rules is a diagnosis of CNLD. If the child has proplast positive, then obviously the nothing else that against congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And you have to rule out associated lacrimal anomalies such as fistula. Now, if the child has signs of inflammation and swelling in the lacrimal sac area, you don't attempt probing and you only manage conservatively initially because any sign of inflammation is an indicator that there is either acute, subacute, or chronic uh, process going on. You also have to identify dactyloseal from congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Dactyloseal is an entity which presents at birth as a bluish swelling as you see here, where not just the NNLD but also the common canaliculus is blocked. The block in the common canaliculus or the canaliculus system may not be organic block, it could just be kinking of the common canaliculus because of the uh, high pressure inside the sac, but nevertheless both the ends of the lacrimal system are blocked and that's why there is retention in the sac and that's called congenital dactyloseal or amniotoseal, which is a medical emergency because this can have intranasal extension. If it is bilateral and if the child has bilateral dactyloseal, if with intranasal extension, since children are obligate nasal breathers, they may actually present with bilateral respiratory testes and they need immediate intervention. Fistula can be highlighted by using a drop of a dye and then you can see the fistula. Otherwise, it's very difficult to localize a fistula in a child given the fact that children are very... Uh, they're not steady, they, they might cry and you might not even see it very carefully. Uh, unless you see it very carefully, you might even miss it. The mothers are the ones who actually point out to the fact that the child has a fistula and putting in a drop of a dye can highlight it.
we don't really need all these investigations in a patient who has pediatric epipura except fluorescein dye associated studies. If Roplas is negative, then if a mother complains of epipura, the best way to rule out obstructive causes would be putting in a dye of fluorescein and looking at the child back after 3 to 5 minutes. If there is retention of good amount of dye in the cuddy sac after 3 to 5 minutes after putting in the dye, that means that there is an obstructive cause for epiphora. Lacrimal scintigraphy, dactylohistography are not really necessary. Nasal endoscopy is not done as a diagnostic modality, but of course it is used as an adjunct while treating. For conservative treatment, mainly you begin with the lacrimal sac legal trend for culture and sensitivity. This may not be routinely done in your practice. You can even start on topical antibiotic empirically, that is chlorophenicol or any antibiotic of your choice that responds to the spectrum of microorganisms that you see in your region. You can change the antibiotic depending on the response or culture sensitivity report. When you advise that massage, you have to ask the parents to do it in a particular way. It is plus hydrostatic sac massage where you use your uh, index finger and with the nail being trimmed short and massage the sac in such a way that while occluding the canalicular system, you propel the contents of the lacrimal sac into the nasolacrimal duct. The hydrostatic pressure that is elevated within the sac system when you do it this way breaks the valvular obstructions. That is the principle. Otherwise, how would massage help if you were to only regurgitate the contents of the sac into the curly sac? Then massage is obviously of no help. It only helps clear the sac. But it has to be hydrostatic sac massage. And when it is done properly, about 90% of children resolve with conservative treatment alone. When we talk about probing, it could be early probing with a child mummified or held in a blanket and then probe. In which case you won't ever be sure whether your probing has been successful or not because you can't syringe and there is also a chance of false passage. So it's always good to wait until the child is about 6 or 7 or even 9 months age before you aesthetize the child and do an OR procedure. There are certain indications for early probing and those being if the child were to have an intraocular pathology such as a genital cataract or glaucoma where you cannot do intraocular surgical intervention without getting rid of the lacrimal sac problem, of course you do early probing. I done probing in children as young as one week old but then those are very rare situations. You can also use recurrent acute acrosis status as one of the indications for early probing. You do that in between two attacks of inflammation extremely symptomatic child or extremely apprehensive parents who cannot take care of conservative management modalities. And neonatal diagnosis to see bilateral with internasal extension. These are indications clearly for early probing. The technique of probing, you should know the anatomy of the lacrimal system. You should realize that it is not as straight as you think it is. It has convolutions both anterior, posterior, medial, lateral. There are known seven variations in the lacrimal pathology, lacrimal anatomy, that is NAD anatomy. But then there are many more variations which you have to figure out during the technique of probing. So you have to be ready for a very convoluted nasolacrimal duct. You have to use a good uh, uh, anesthesia technique. Laryngeal mask is ideal because you can even syringe it with, without uh, much issue and the recovery is very fast. And you have to have the entire set of probes as you see here, not just one size because you have to use the concept called uh, size wise concept where depending on the age of the child you have to use a particular size probe and this is the size of the standard set of probes. In a child who is less than 3 months old, you use double zero probe and as the child becomes uh, higher in terms of age, the size of the probe varies. You use a larger probe in an older child. And you dilate the upper punctum, dilate portion of the vertical canaliculars, pull the lateral cancers laterally to straighten the canalicular system and insert the probe. If you don't do that, you might hit against the resistance and then cause false passage. And as you advance the probe medially, you hit a hard stop. That is, you have encountered the medial wall of the sac. Then the probe is turned down gently, downwards laterally and posteriorly and encounter further resistance that will be the valvular obstruction. And how do you know that you are in the right track? By doing what is called a spring test. You spring the probe laterally, you spring back into its position, same happens vertically. That means that it is embedded into the bony NAD and it is also aligned to the trochlea at that point in time. Then you gently advance the probe until you break through this valvular obstruction which you generally feel or hear as a pop. And once that is done, you can withdraw the probe and do syringing. 
Suppose there is stiff resistance, withdrawal a little bit because the anatomy of the NID may be variable and explored by changing the direction. And if the uh, stop is still stiff or hard, then you should consider bony obstruction. In terms patients who have pulse passage, there would be disproportionate resistance within the soft tissue. The external direction of the probe will not be aligned with the trochlea. Spring test will be negative, there will be brisk bleeding. In such situations, you can repeat probing through the lower punctum or abandon it for a better day. When you have a bony obstruction within the nasal acrimal duct, generally it is either relative or uh, complete bony obstruction. Here you do what is called stepwise probing. So suppose you started with number one probe, you go back to zero or even double zero and try probing. Suppose double zero closes, then you understand that it is a relative bony obstruction. Then you can go back in size to zero and one and then try probing again with one. So this is called boring and training manoeuvre. We gradually increase the probe size going back to where it actually passes through and then coming back to a higher size and that will dilate the relatively stenose nasal acrimal duct. If the NLD is obstructed beyond the nasal acrimal duct, if there is hard stop beyond the NLD, then that is generally inferior turbinate. We have to do endoscopy and medialize the inferior turbinate and that will increase the success rate of the probing uh, drastically. And uh, of course, this is just to confirm that you have successfully probed metal to metal contact. Nasal endoscopy is a good guide and syringing is confirmatory. I will skip the video because there is very little time there. Post, -post probing, you continue with the uh, sac massage, topical antibiotics is required, and nasal decongestant are mandatory for a week. Results of probing is well done, 90 to 98 percent success uh, if it is done between 6 to 12 months. And uh, this is an example of bilateral nacrocystocene following probing with complete resolution. If the probing is beyond 12 months, there is generally a decreasing success with increasing age. As the age increases, the success rate dips. This is by about 10 per percent per year, they say, in beyond years, the success rate is about 50 percent. That's because you pre, pre select fever that would have resolved, resolved already, radiotherapy therapy would have resolved, resolved. Left out for you to resolve conservatively is those with it which have a, which have a relative hard block, block or a company obstruction, which likely is here.